do so. And I'm very motivated to comply with that referent group, especially during my adolescent years. Now compare that with, uh, again, during the adolescent years and parents. My parents think that I should not smoke. We've discussed it at home. They've told me repeatedly that I should not smoke. But during my adolescent years, I'm not particularly concerned about uh, appeasing my parents or doing what they would like. In fact, perhaps even the opposite would be true. If they tell me not to, then I'm more likely to engage in the behavior. So just like the behavioral belief and the outcome evaluation um, work together in kind of a synergistic relationship, so do the motivation to comply construct and the normative belief construct. That is, if my referent groups think if my referent group thinks that I should or should not engage in a behavior, and I'm highly motivated to comply with with their uh, my perception of their opinions, well then I'm very motivated or have high intentions to engage in the behavior. Here are simple examples of motivation to comply. Um, doing what other general practitioners do is important to me. So it is, is it important to me to do what my peers do? The government's approval of my clinical practice is important to me. The approval of my patients with type 2 diabetes is important to me. So by, by modifying or changing these examples a little bit, we get things like, um, I don't care what the CDC recommends regarding vaccines. I don't care what my doctor says to me about being vaccinated. Or, by contrast, I do care. It's a credible source. I care what my doctor says. I seek his approval and his opinion. Okay, now the constructs we've talked about up to this point represent uh, the theory of reasoned action. Now we're going to add this additional, these additional constructs and we'll have the theory of planned behavior. And the first one, again as I mentioned, the justification of the rationale for the, the inclusion of this construct was that up until now all we've talked about are attitudes and social norms, um, things that influence behavioral intentions, but they don't represent kind of the unexpected aspect of the environment. So I mentioned um, that uh, perhaps we could have attitudes that are conducive to uh, getting a, a mammography, meaning that we believe that early detection is important for a better prognosis, and we really, really value um, the, the, the information that we could get from a, a mammography such that we could either uh, deal with or treat uh, breast cancer or the peace of mind to know that I don't have it, um, sub, uh, the subjective norm, my parents, my spouse, everybody surrounding me thinks it's important for me to be screened, especially since we have a family history of, a, of, of breast cancer. And I'm very motivated to comply with all of these people. They're all very important to me. Okay, so all of those things might indicate that the person is likely to engage in the behavior, high behavioral intentions for seeking the mammography. Now, the environment um, might complicate things. So take, for example, the circumstance of somebody who they might have a family history of breast cancer and all of the things that I've just indicated, meaning that uh, family and friends think it's important. They even think it's important. But perhaps they work a job, let's say, um, let's say you work a, uh, a, a nanny job. Or let's say you work at a factory. Or let's say you work construction. Or any other type of job where you might perceive yourself to be vulnerable or expendable in terms of um, uh, if, if I don't show up, well, then I could get fired. If I don't show up, I don't get money and I really need the money. So those things uh, represent an environmental barrier. And the perceived behavioral control is comp comprised of 
two constructs. One is the control belief, or the perceived likelihood of occurrence of facilitating or constraining conditions. And the second is a perceived power. Now let me talk about each of these individually. The control belief is the belief about internal and external factors that may inhibit or facilitate the performance of the behavior. So, for example, um, how likely is it to, uh, how likely am I to jog when it's raining outside? Now, this is very um, similar to the idea of situational self, situation specific self efficacy. And in fact, many people believe that um, perceived behavioral control is, is actually. Um, the kind of the inclusion of self-efficacy into the theory of reasoned action and the theory of planned behavior. Perceived power. The perception about how easy or difficult it is for performing the behavior in each condition identified in the control beliefs. For example, when it is raining, is it very difficult for me to jog? And the examples here are, I feel under social pressure to measure the blood pressure of these patients. I am confident that I can measure the blood pressure of these patients in the consultation if I want to. So um, let me give you some different examples. So we'll go back to the example of the, uh, 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 of the fictitious person um, seeking a mammography. So if I work a job, that does not allow me to uh, get time off, for example. That's a control belief. That, um, well, let's say, for example, um, I'm not able to get time off. To the extent that I'm able to get uh, navigate that system, um, that's my control belief. Now, the perceived power is, can I go to my boss and can I be assertive and say, I need time off? Um, let's talk about um, sexual risk behaviors, condom use. So um, if you're, most, most adolescent sexual encounters involve a, an older male and a younger female. So let's say a 17-year-old male and a 14 or 15-year-old female. Now, under normal conditions, she may believe that using contraception or actually avoiding sexual intercourse altogether would be preferable. And if the behavior here, let's say the behavior here is um, negotiating for no sex, so she does not want to have sex. So she thinks that by not, and now I'm talking about attitude, she thinks that, um, that not having sex will result, that will uh, preclude her uh, contracting an STI or unwanted pregnancy. Those are things that she really values. Um, her friends um, generally don't support her engaging in sexual, uh, in sexual activity at the age of 14. Certainly her parents do not agree with it. Um, and now the control, let's talk about control beliefs and, and perceived power. Now, there's an age discrepancy, the older male, and she feels a lot of pressure, the control belief. She feels the pressure that, that maybe she should engage in this behavior despite the, the other um, constructs not being conducive. And so to what extent is she assertive and able to negotiate for um, no sex? So, for example, can she say something like, um, thank you, I really like you. I'm actually not ready for this right now. An example of perceived power. I can navigate this system. I can negotiate this system for my good, for my health benefit, so that I don't engage in this behavior. Well, to the extent that she's able to, then she would have high control belief and high perceived power or high uh, behavioral control. Now, here are some strengths um, of the theory of reason action or the theory of planned behavior. Um, one of them, and, and I um, have found this in my own research, is that it provides very precise guidance regarding the measurement. 
So the theory of planned behavior is very nice. It's a very nice theoretical framework when measuring. Um, I'm going to give you a couple of examples in, in just a few minutes um, about studies that I've done where I've involved or used the theory of, of planned behavior and it, it's very easy for measurement. Also, it's very nice for um, helping us to design interventions. So, for example, we can measure attitudes. If attitudes don't seem conducive to engaging in the behavior, well, then that's the focus of a future intervention. Or if social norms um, seem to um, be the problem, well, then that's the focus of the future intervention. And so, from that standpoint, it's very nice. Um, it, it, it works very well as a diagnostic tool um, and very prescriptive for the intervention development. There are some limitations, however. Um, it, it's uh, and, and there's a list of four of these here. Um, probably the one that I'm going to focus on, or, or the two that I'm going to focus on most, are um, the well. Th this last one that focuses only on rational thoughts and does not imbibe irrational thoughts or fears. So, uh, essentially, what this means is that. Uh, a lot of people believe that it's very limited in its scope, um, given that there are tons and tons of public health related behaviors. Many of them are more spontaneous, um, not so premeditated. And, and so this would, uh, and that's one of the underlying principles that uh, um, Isaac Asgen and Martin Fishbein stated early on that this is most relevant for rational, premeditated behaviors.